Welcome back everyone to Sherlock Holmes vs. Jack the Ripper. We got some medicine. Now we're gonna go back to Watson and give the medicine. Find the medicine, Holmes. Find the medicine, Holmes. We must make haste. Oh, there we go. Ooh, same controls. Here is the medication, Watson. Is our man movable? He should be able to stand in a few minutes and will no longer be suffering from his cough before long. Consider the affair resolved. Accompany him to his nieces while I return to the boarding house and then join me at the police station. Let's return to the boarding house. Okay. Um, can I run this way? It's like I want to check this out. Wow, it's so dark. <laughs> Come on. I want to run around a bit because, you know, I'm going to check out all the surroundings. Oh. I have good news for you, Mr. Finley. We have sent the captain to stay with a relative, and he shouldn't bother you for a while. I also have some good news. I have your police bag. Thank you. I bid you good day. Oh, it was nothing. Tell me, one of my wife's friends lost... Another day, Finley. Another day. Let's go to the police station. <laughs> yeah. Another day, Finley. Another day. <laughs> Police station, hello. Are you sure it's the police bag that you lost? Yes, but someone attempted to force it open. They didn't succeed, but now the lock is stuck. Perhaps you could. Hmm. Let's see. Maybe I could. Okay, what are we doing? Uh, good question. Uh, oh, okay, there are no instructions. Or maybe we want one, two, three, four, five, six. Ah, okay, okay, I see how this works. Mm-mm-mm. Um... Um Actually, this works. Oh no! Oh, it's so cool. Oh no, no, no. These two have changed. No, that one is. Oh no. Oh no. I forgot that the five needs to be down there. Okay. Hmm. And we have. This one has to be a four. Yay! Ah, uh, a big thank you, Mr. Holmes. Think nothing of it, my friend. So, the reports. Why don't you wait till the inspectors get back? You would certainly learn more. If I wanted to meet the inspectors, I would have done so. So, give me the preliminary reports, and above all, do not mention my visit to anyone. Is that clear? Sure, if that's what you want. Here are the reports. Thank you. I like how we... with his finger. Here are the reports. Alright, death of Polly Nichols, 31st of August, 1888. Autopsy report by Dr. Henry Levelin, surgeon. Her throat had been cut from left to right, two distinct cuts being on the left side, the windpipe, gullet, and spinal cord being cut through. A bruise apparently of a thumb being on the right lower jaw, also one on the left cheek. The abdomen had been cut open from the center of the bottom of the ribs and of the ribs, ribs, 
the along right side, under the pelvis to the left of the stomach, there the wound was jagged. The omentum or coating of the stomach was also cut in several places, and two small stabs on private parts, apparently done with a strong bladed knife, supposed to have been done by some left-handed person, death being almost instantaneous. Have you obtained the preliminary reports? Yes, we'll read them on the go. Let's to the scene of the crime at Bucks Row, Watson. All right. Map. Scene of Polly Nichols' murder. All right. Let's go. Ooh. Here we go. But what are all these people doing here, Holmes? Apparently, they came to see the scene of the crime. What about us? Aren't we going to see it? We will return this evening, Watson. The circumstances should be ideal for carrying out our little experiments. Well, Watson, we are at the scene of the Polly Nichols murder. Imagine the victim lying at the spot where she was found and try to discern all of the clues we can. Watson, you are a writer. I am therefore entrusting you with our deduction board. It will help us to establish certain facts. Understood, Holmes. Ah, so the deduction board comes into play here. Okay. The body was lying on its back, legs straightened slightly apart. The skirt had been lifted up to the middle of the body. The left hand was touching the barn door. Mm, okay. The corpse was still warm. Uh. The body was still warm. Let's reread the preliminary report for the details on the wounds inflicted upon this poor woman. Let's look at this poor woman more closely. The throat was slit from left to right. There are two incisions. There is a bruise at the level of the right maxilla. The tongue is swollen. Okay, um... A small pool of blood, six inches in diameter. Um... There is a bruise on the left cheek. A small pool of blood, six inches in diameter. Yes. I don't know if I'm there done. There is a bruise at or... the left. The throat was slit from left to right. Okay, maybe I'm done. Um. There is a black bonnet near the left hand. No marks on the ground. The ground is muddy. Okay. Mm. No signs of blood. Okay. Let's go to our deduction board. Uh, no footsteps on the ground. Tongue is bloated. Throat was slit from left to right. The victim is bruised. Okay, the corpse was still warm, no footsteps on the ground, the murderer cut open Polly Nichols' throat, the victim was dumped, the murderer warmed the victim up, the victim wasn't dragged. I'd say maybe the victim wasn't dragged? I don't know, okay. Uh, the victim has a bruise on the right jawbone. The murderer beat the victim, the bruise was caused by hard pressure with the fingers, the murderer gagged the victim, victim by gripping tightly. Well, we sort of know already. So yeah. Um, P. Nichols' murder took place in the daytime, took place on the premises. Took place on the premises. She was strangled, poisoned, or suffocated. Tongue is bloated. She was probably suffocated. No, wait, strangled. I don't know what the difference is, but, you know. Okay. Black bonnet, little pool of blood. Okay. No traces of blood on the walls. The victim had her throat slit. 
The wall was washed. The killer slit the victim's throat quietly. The victim didn't have her throat, throat slit while standing. A little, pool, a little pool of blood. The blood spurted. The blood didn't flow in strong spurts. The murderer wanted to drain the victim of her blood. I guess it didn't flow in strong spurts. Dirt and damp ground. Dirty and damp ground. He could not have had relations on the ground. The murderer threw water on the ground. There were relations on the ground. He did not have relations on the ground. Pinnacles wasn't killed here. Pinnacles was dead before being stretched out, having her throat slit. Pinnacles was killed by having her throat slit. No, she was already dead. Because otherwise the blood would have spurted. Whee! Okay, but this, this is kind of like the future deduction boards. Okay. Uh, is there something else you want me to find? Uh... I don't know. Close. Whoops. I don't know. Oh, oh my gosh! Watson, you creepy. This spot is deserted, Holmes. The prostitutes only come here to exercise. Holy crap, Watson, you scared the crap out of me. There is only one street light lit on this street, Watson, and this spot is particularly poorly lit. Well, Watson, we have found all of the possible clues, I think. Yes. But we will now attempt to recreate the scene of the murder. Come closer, Watson. I have to make you up. Okay. You are joking, Holmes. I feel ridiculous, Holmes. Aww. Now, Watson, come and stand here in front of me. You shall play the role of the poor woman, and I shall play that of the murderer. Let's try to reconstruct the facts to ensure the final result corresponds indisputably to the way that Polly Nichols was killed. Okay. Um... Oh, uh oh. Left hand? No, like that. This position is unlikely. Oh. Okay. Yes, it's quite possible the events occurred like this. This is pretty cool. Uh, okay. And then we have... I hope that, as with the real murder, nobody had to witness all of that, Watson. If the murderer used his right hand to stride his victim, there wasn't much room. The murderer had enough room to inflict the wounds to the neck, and these wounds suggest the left hand was used. My dear Watson, now that we have found all of our clues, nothing remains but to subject them to our most likely hypotheses in order to deduce the facts. Okay! <laughs> Always fun. On the job with Holmes. The black, a black bond near the left hand, poorly lit street, the prostitutes only go down the street to exercise. The victim was holding her bonnet in her hand at the time of the murder. The bonnet was already on the ground, the victim wasn't cold. She's holding her bonnet. She was asking for alms. She wasn't afraid. Victim collected the bonnet from the ground. She wasn't afraid, maybe. Nichols wasn't cautious. Nichols didn't have a bonnet. Nichols had her bonnet in her hand and was ready to exercise. Nice. Going, Watson. The murderer must have been sitting on the victim. Knife in the left hand or right. The murderer was standing in front of the victim to strangle her. Killer's right head prevented the victim from screaming. There were relations while standing up. The killer's left hand prevents the victim from screaming. Left, I think. The killer strangled the victim with his right hand. With both hands. No, he strangled with the right hand. Uh, Pinnacles, killer was left-handed. Had two knives. Is Pinnacles' murder right-handed or left-handed? Uh... Is 
It's a big man, strong man, it's a woman. Okay, something is wrong here. Um... What is wrong here? Left hand. Oh wait, right hand. Why is none of these right though? Um Interesting. No, but it, it looked like when Holmes did it, it was left hand prevented the victim from screaming. Strangle her with the right hand. And the throat was slit from left to right. Um, so he was left handed. That was a strong man? Hmm. Something is very wrong here. <laughs> Why are these not green? Okay, help. You must deduce the facts based on the observations that you made. The crime scenes, click on the observation on the left side of the screen and position it in one of the spaces on the center. Um, three possible deductions will display. You must choose one. Once all the facts on the right and the right side of the screen have been green outlined, you, your deduction work on the murder. Yes, I know that. that that's not my problem. <laughs> Oh wait, maybe this is wrong. Oh no, wait, the bruise was caused by hard pressure, yeah. Oh, maybe, I No. Fingers, yeah. Uh. How come this is wrong? Like, how, how is this, a, how is this red? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, I can't really, I can't do anything with these. Hmm. 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 Okay, maybe that one. Doesn't really matter. I'm pretty sure about that these are the facts. Like, I don't understand where, where I'm wrong. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure this is all right, but apparently not. Mm. So I'm presuming that these are not right because maybe one of these is wrong. But I'm not sure. The victim has a bruise on the right jawbone. Mm. And you would then use your left hand. Murder gagged the victim by gripping tightly. I don't know. I mean, this is basically the same as was caused by hard pressure with the fingers. Left hand prevented the victim from screaming. Okay, fine, let's do it like this then. Both hands? Okay, right, right hand. <laughs> Game! Stop it! No. Oh, you could do this. Okay. Uh, no, no. Left. And right. Oh wait, I had right here. In that case, I need to have left here. No, 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 I, no, no, no. Left hand. Right hand. Oh, 
Oh my god. The victim was most probably dead before being laid down. Once the heart stopped, gravity drained the body slowly, not in a heavy spurt that would have stained half the street. Thank you, Holmes. I understand why you told me not to change clothes. Do you realize that our behavior didn't alarm anyone? The victim's ordeal was even more discreet. By acting in silence, we have confirmed something. The crime definitely took place here. The victim and her murderer were able to come here without making any noise, and afterwards the murder took place without the slightest cry being uttered. Come, Watson, let's go home. We have spent far too long in this sinister alley. And so, my dear Watson, the day and night which we passed in Whitechapel were enlightening, weren't they? An adventure that I most certainly will never relate, to be in the skin of that poor woman. I prefer not to speak of it further. But have we really learned anything about the murderer? Obviously a man, given the necessary strength. We have little to go on, at least no more than the police. But in my opinion, Inspector Abilene has a trick or two up his sleeve. No, I want to talk about the facts and what we can draw from them. We know where the crime was committed, and under what conditions. I would like to ask you about the possible motives for the crime. According to you, Watson, what could have pushed the murderer to act in such a way? <laughs> All right. What could have been possible motive? Revenge. Love, theft, madness, black magic. The victim suffered horrible mutilations. Uh, maybe? Homicidal insanity, Holmes. It is indubitable that the man who did this to Polly Nichols is not of his full senses. The victim lived in misery. The resent resentment can lead to irreparable acts. Revenge, Holmes? Revenge could be a possible motive, but with one small reservation. We have reason to believe that the victim considered her murderer to be a typical client. The victim was an occasional prostitute without family or ties. Credible motive, even if it's a field the Sherlock doesn't know! Black magic? I'm not terribly interested in the occult or black magic. Let's give the benefit of the doubt to this motive. A personal drama. Love can certainly lead to many a drama, but we have to consider the fact that the victim didn't know her attacker. Hmm. Theft, perhaps. I have a hard time believing that someone would attack poor Polly so fiercely just to rob her of a few coins. Mm. Uh. Maybe? A personal drama. Love can certainly lead... Yeah, 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 yeah. Um... What do we do here? Elementary. Oh, Very okay. well, Watson. I think that we've exhausted the topic. Take a rest and we'll speak again later. Ah, it would seem that the investigation is advancing, Holmes. Yesterday's star said that a suspect is in the hands of the police. A man with a rather sinister reputation. I was about to join you in your optimistic outlook until you informed me that the good news came from the press, Watson. But surely they wouldn't invent the fact that the police are holding a suspect or the acts that are attributed to him. You will have an exact answer to these two questions in less than 50 seconds, Watson. Pardon? Enter, Inspector. Good day. Dear Watson, allow me to introduce Inspector Abilene. Inspector, Dr. Watson. Inspector? To what do we owe the honor of your presence, Inspector? I heard that the two of you made your way to Whitechapel a few days ago. Your arrival, you are aware, coincides with a very serious affair which our police service is going to great lengths to solve and which is creating strong tensions in the area. Pardon me, but haven't you arrested someone? A certain leather apron? Absolutely not. The man who hides behind this name is indeed being actively searched for by the force. Besides, nothing at the moment suggests that he is the Bucks Row murderer. There, you've been enlightened, Watson. Now it is our turn to answer Inspector Abilene's questions. Indeed. I will be brief and precise. 
Do you intend to investigate this case, or have you already started? It is to be of service to a friend that I went to Whitechapel. We did, out of curiosity, familiarize ourselves with the preliminary reports, and we made our way to the scene of the crime. Our conclusions are slim, as are the clues. Having not been officially appointed by a client, I believe that my intervention in this business will end there. Very well. To be frank, you take the weight off my shoulders by distancing yourself from the case. Our image isn't very good, to say nothing of what the press puts us through. Thus, if overnight they found out that you were on the case, people would turn against us. And they would pester me, overwhelm me, and finally make me out to be responsible for the inevitable failure such a scenario entails. Neither you nor I wish for this to happen. I know that your time is precious, Inspector. I will send you a note regarding my conclusions shortly. With pleasure. Gentlemen? Do you think that he will find the murderer? The chances are slim to non-existent. It is seven days now, short of a confession from the murderer himself. And you will not go further? You heard the Inspector Watson. My presence in Whitechapel would hinder, which doesn't mean that we will drop the case. How is that? The Inspector spoke of me, but not of us. It is you, Watson, who will lead the investigation tonight. It is you who will bring to the police station the little note that I will write regarding our conclusions. Despite the late hour, there is nothing to stop you from making inquiries about this famous leather apron while you are there. Oh, dear. Watson, have fun. Okay. Let's read about Leather Apron from the Star. Thursday, 6th of September, 1888. Largest circulation of any evening paper in the kingdom. One half penny. Leather Apron. More about his career, his latest movements in the borough. The sense of fear which the murder of the unfortunate woman Nichols has thrown over the neighborhood, and especially over her companions, shows no sign of decreasing. A number of the street wanderers are a nightly terror of Leather Apron. One of our reporters visited one of the single woman, women's lodging houses last night. It is in Thrall Street, one of the darkest and most terrible looking spots in Whitechapel. The house keeps open till 1 o'clock in the morning and reopens again at 5. In the house, nightly, are 66 women who get their bed for 4D, whatever that is. The proprietor of the place, who is also owner of several other houses of a similar character in the neighborhood, told some gruesome stories of the man who has now come to be regarded as the terror of the East End. Night after night, he said, had women come in in a fainting condi condition after being knocked about by a leather apron. He himself would never be out in the neighborhood after 12 o'clock at night except with a loaded revolver. The terror, he said, would go to a public house or coffee room and peep in through the window to see if a particular woman was there. He would then vanish, lying in wait for his victim at some convenient corner hidden from the view of everybody. The police are making efforts to arrest him, but he constantly ch changes his quarters. Some of the unfortunate women state that he is now in one of the low slums in the borough. One of them said she saw him crossing London Bridge stealthily as usual with head bent, his skimpy coat turned up about his ears and looking as if he were in a desperate hurry. The hunt for leather apron began in earnest last evening. Constables 43 and 173, J Division, into whose hands leather apron fell on Sunday afternoon, were detailed to accompany Detective Enright of the J Division in a search through all the quarters where the crazy Jew was likely to be. They began at half past ten in Church Street in Shoreditch, rumor having located the suspected man there. They went through lodging houses into pubs down side streets, through their bullseye into every shadow, and searched the quarter thoroughly, but without result. The hunt continued. L or, the hunt continued later down in the Brick Lane neighborhood, Florendine Lane being Leather Apron's preferred lodging place lately. He was not found here, however, and the search, which then took the direction of the London Hospital, resulted in nothing. It is the general belief that the man has left the district. The clue furnished by the woman who denounced the man on Sunday is a very unfortunate one. Her offer to prove by two women that Leather Apron was seen walking with a murdered woman in Baker's Row at 2 o'clock last Friday morning is the most direct piece of evidence that yet has appeared. His conduct on Sunday was as unusual. He never answers a question when it is put to him and only speaks under strong compulsion. Mike... Mm, the grocer in George's yard dwelt a long time last evening on this peculiarity. He knows Leather Apron very well and has known him for six years. He says that 
the man is un unquestionably mad, and that anybody who met him face to face would know it, that his eyes are never still, but are always shifting uneasily, and he never looks anybody in the eye. Leather Apron used to live in the lodging house around the corner from the grocery, and had was turned out of there some months ago with an order not to return. The lodging house is a few doors below the model doorway in which the Turner woman was found with 39 stabs. There we go, and it is time for us to take a break. And continue in the next episode. So thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see ya.